Well, that was a very quick break. Uh, what we wanted to do now, again, is shift gears and talk about the history, if you will, of the Illinois Pottery. Well, we go back about 90 years ago uh, when really a group of farmers in Tazewell County decided to get together uh, to work on some of the issues back then where they thought by forming a state organization or a county organization that time, which led into a state organization, they would be more effective than trying to just go it alone as an individual. So really, uh, 90 years ago, we basically formed uh, Illinois Farm Bureau, and uh, out of that grew uh, not only the Farm Bureau as we know it, but a number of affiliate, affiliated companies. And we're kind of unique as a farm organization because back then, you know, a, a lot of farmers were having trouble uh, being able to attract insurance carriers to insure their vehicles or their livestock or their farms. So out of that grew Country Companies Insurance. Today we call it Country Financial, uh, where we still provide uh, what we think is affordable insurance uh, to our farmer clients as well as, you know, our city cousins. Um, at that time, uh, through the evolution of that 90 plus year period, there were problems focused on trying to get services and supplies to farmers, i.e. fuel. And out of that came the Growmark system or the farm supply system. Today we call it Growmark. Um, also under the Farm Bureau of Illinois Farm Bureau, uh, there were challenges as far as marketing dairy products. Um, and uh, probably one of the most successful uh, ventures that we have been a part of for a long period of time has been Prairie Farms Dairy. That it not only do we have 800 some dairy producers that are part of that uh, co-op, but they take it one step farther and they market the products and, and it's been very successful from a profitability standpoint with still today a group of farmers that operate that board of directors trying to improve their bottom line. And last but not least, uh, we have a, uh, a uh, affiliate uh, that looks uh, after uh, audit procedures of auditing not only our county farm bureaus, but a number of the Growmark uh, uh, elevators. That's the Illinois Agriculture Auditing Association. All of those particular ventures or those affiliates are under the umbrella of Illinois Agriculture Association, commonly known as the Illinois Farm Bureau. Okay. Um, I kind of want to take a closer view of each one of these, if we could. Uh, the country financial and the insurance side, I'm curious of why other insurance companies weren't willing to step in long ago and uh, service the farming community. Well, this, this predates me, but uh, going back, uh, you know, 75 plus years ago when country companies at that time uh, was created, uh, there were a number of particular situations as it related to rural communities, uh, particularly farmers, um, whether it was crop insurance, whether it was building insurance, whether it was life insurance, health insurance. You know, go back that amount of time period, there wasn't uh, near the uh, type of structure and a number of companies that we have today that try to service those. I think in over time, We've addressed not only what the farmer wanted, but what the local communities want, and that's why I think we've been successful. We've grown that one state operation that started uh, because services weren't being met uh, in the particular areas of the state of Illinois to now country financial is in 40 different states and uh, servicing for the most part uh, people that we do b business with best, and that's the rural people, but we now have also gravitated into some of the larger urban markets as well. That includes life, auto, health insurance? We uh, dropped the health insurance line uh, about um, half a dozen years ago. Uh, we just were having more and more challenges to try to, you know, keep the, the rates attractive at the same time to compete against some of the larger providers, and we exited out of that. and. Uh, basically another carrier provides the health insurance. But that's one of the critical areas in 
for a farmer, if they don't have some other employment that has a health policy attached to it, that can be incredibly expensive, can it, to get their own health insurance? It can be. Um, we've dealt with that issue for a number of years that, that farmers are self-employed, that they do pay their, their own health insurance. And as our farmers' ages continue to creep up, average age of a farmer today is about 57 years of age. And as you get older, the demands on health insurance needs go higher. And uh, we were very concerned when we exited that, but uh, we exited to the largest uh, provider in the state of Illinois. We have an agreement with them, and they've been able to provide that at uh, much more affordable rates than what we were able to when we had to close our shop. And who is that? Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the crop insurance side, because I thought that was actually an aspect that the federal government provides. It is, but uh, we are a carrier of that. Uh, we have uh, uh, 15 regional crop specialists across the state for Country Financial that really works with farmers and their local agent uh, at the local level uh, to help a farmer decide what type, what level, what kind of crop insurance they may need to uh, manage their price risk as well as their marketing risk. Well, I'll put you on the spot here. Let's personalize it if we can. What kind of crop insurance do you have on your corn and soybeans? Well, in our farming operation this last year, we took uh, a 75% level of revenue uh, coverage, uh, revenue assurance, they call it RA. Uh, and that would protect us uh, against 75%. It would put a floor in 75% of what our adjusted yield is on an annual basis. Uh, Unfortunately, last year, for the most part, uh, we raised just enough corn and the prices were just good enough that it didn't kick in. But you, you don't buy insurance to make money, you buy it to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what's the mechanism, though, in terms of buying that insurance? You're saying 75% of the yield, and then you've got to factor in the market side of the equation, do you not? Yes, and part of the revenue coverage on this particular product is based at, off of a... Um, crop price and we had a fall harvest option, option. These are very complicated projects. <laughs> but anyway, there's a fall harvested option, so that price is triggered then in in regards to not only fall but what the price was set in the spring of the year uh, come March. Why is the this previous a, year. Why is this a federal program rather than some of the other classic uh, insurance policies? Why does the federal government need to be involved in crop insurance? Well, traditionally, uh, there is uh, a certain amount of crop insurance nationwide that is un underwritten as part of the Farm Bill uh, as, as a means of trying to protect farmers from catastrophic losses. And part of the hitch to a farm program or a Farm Bill is the government feels that as farmers, you ought to at least protect yourself to a degree before you can participate in these programs. So it's been kind of the, the, the um, adjoining of crop insurance uh, with farm programs over a period of time that say, before we're going to help you on a catastrophic event, you need to have some skin in the game, so to speak, to have crop insurance. Ironically, if you look at the three big eyes, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, we are net uh, losers on crop insurance. The major crop insurance claims are paid in the south and the west uh, in this country. But we pay some of the biggest premiums. But w the way I look at it is, you know, you also have high value crops today where, you know, you're trying to at least protect yourself from a huge, you know, price catastrophe or yield catastrophe in the event that you have a drought or a, a hailstorm or something like that. So the ones that oftentimes the collect are corn growers or they've got um, you know, vegetable operations where they get a frost at the wrong time or something happens. And or you get uh, you know out in the, the Great Plains where they don't get rain and they may put a wheat crop in and it dies. Or you get down in the south, uh, cotton crops, uh, rice crops. There's a lot more volatility. Mm -hmm. um, and from an actuary standpoint, 
It's a lot easier to grow corn and soybeans in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana given our soils okay. uh, and the average rainfall that we normally receive. As we go through these, I'd like to have you address the specific relationship between the Farm Bureau and each one of these organizations. So let's start with uh, Country Financial. Well, uh, in terms of your position as specialist. Okay. Well, I'm president uh, and chairman of the board of directors at Country Financial. Our, our boards are very much the same from the Farm Bureau side to Country Financial with the exception uh, that we do have an outside director uh, who basically uh, that, that is rotated uh, amongst people that we think bring a unique experience to the board to look a little bit outside of the box of what we bring to the board. But um, it's a board of directors of 20 people, uh, the 18 districts plus the president and the vice president. Um, Farm Bureau then, for the most part, you know, is the, I would say, you might say the beneficiary of country financial. Um, you know, we, we use some of the resources um, of country financial to carry out some of the services in Illinois Farm Bureau. So um, one of our oldest affiliates um, and very prosperous affiliates uh, that we have uh, in our portfolio. Okay, so people in Iowa and Indiana are also helping to fund Illinois Farm Bureau operation to a certain extent. No, not really, because okay. the, the operations in Illinois are the only ones that are designated okay. internally. The other just goes to the surplus of the organization. Um, let's go next to Growmark. What did that start out as? Well, as farm supply, um, and really that uh, what started in Illinois, and then it grew to Iowa and Wisconsin, and now has branched into other states, uh, and as well as on in, into Canada. So it's a fairly large uh, farm supply organization, or farm service organization. And you mentioned it started primarily as supplying fuel to farmers. Is that still the case? Yes, uh, they very much uh, not only do deal with fuel, but fertilizer. Uh, a lot of inputs uh, that, that farmers use, myself included, are purchased from one of the Growmark member companies uh, out in your local area. Herbicides and pesticides? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and they've got into you know, a number of the crop inputs, um, you know, and they, they service home heating oil as well, too. So. It's, it's a fairly rounded uh, service organization for agriculture inputs. Well, as we're driving across Illinois sometimes, and you get the right time of the year, you see uh, crop dusters out there. Is that an aspect of Growmark as well? Yes, it is. Uh, they contract. Uh, they don't own any of those planes, but they contract with crop dusters that put fungicides on corn or pesticides on any various uh, aspect of a disease problem that is focusing on crop production. So what we've just discussed is a huge business in and of itself, is it not? It is, I, and I think we're fairly unique because I think we in our organization in the past have always had leadership that has said, okay, if we can't find this by somebody else doing it, they've always rolled up the shirt sleeves and said, maybe we can do it internally. And that's why you've got an AgriVisor LLC that's why we started Growmark. That's why we have Country Financial. That's why we have Prairie Farms Dairy and uh, IAAA on the auditing side. Okay. And your particular relationship with Growmark? I am a member of the coordinating committee uh, of Growmark. Uh, we also, you know, I dialogue with their chief executive officer uh, from time to time and their chairman of the board. So we have a very close relationship and they're also a part of our building complex here is where their headquarters is housed. But that's quite distinct from your relationship you have with Country Financial. Yes, it, you know, it started out that way and they've grown over time. Uh, you might say uh, the young kid back then grew up to be an adult and they've, they've uh, done things on their own, but uh, I'd like to think that uh, we're still very close as a family uh, we ver work very closely. AgriVisor LLC is a joint um, venture with them. Uh, they use their Midco commodities uh, as well as our old AgriVisor and merge those two together. 
So, you know, it's a joint venture, but uh, at the same time, uh, they're still part of the family. I'll tell you a secret. When I came to the building one time and was asking for you, uh, a couple of them didn't recognize your name, so maybe they are rather distinctive in their own respect. I'm wondering why that's the case. Why that different relationship from Century Financial? Well, first of all, we have two separate boards of directors. We do have an interlocking board member but on But it didn't Roma. start that way, did it? Uh, no. Years ago, it was one of the same, but then as they gravitated and they went outside of the state, and they, they put uh, board members on from Iowa and from Wisconsin. And as it grew over time, the, still the majority of the board members of Gromart still reside in Illinois. But they have somebody from Ontario, they have a couple from Iowa and a couple from Wisconsin. And now they've, they've actually uh, grown their organization out east, so they have various zones and regions of which they have uh, board members from. So. Yeah, out of the outgrowth where it started is the same, you know, through the need really to give more dedication and time allocation and direction. Uh, you can't be everything to everybody, and we have a fairly large organization the way that it is. And okay. to be honest, I don't think today one board could service everything that we do. Okay. Um, Prairie Farm, let's talk a little bit about the origins of Prairie Farm and where they have evolved today. Well, it's probably one of the larger dairy co-ops in the country, uh, but it started right here in Illinois. A guy by the name of Fletcher Gorley was the first CEO, and they started, you might say, almost a mom-and-pop shop uh, where a group of dairy farmers wanted to do something more than just milk the cows and, and you know, uh, grow the milk, so to speak. They wanted to have a marketing mechanism. So... Um, you know, out of that, uh, they, the vision and that board of directors uh, at that time grew the organization to not only service Illinois, now it services, I don't know how many states we're in, but it's a number of them, and um, has been, become very successful. And as a co-op, I think the thing that really separates Prairie Farms from others is they, they receive a fairly handsome uh, patronage refund as at the end of the year. Uh, based on the results or the operating results of Prairie Farms as an organization. So it's been very successful. Farmers love the organization from the standpoint of what it does for them and help them market their product. When you say co-op, I assume you mean that the individual dairy farmers own a piece of that company then? That is correct. Uh, is this in Wisconsin and Minnesota, some of these other major dairy producing states? Uh, we're not, we don't have that big a footprint in Wisconsin. Uh, we're in Michigan, uh, we're in Kentucky, we're in Tennessee, we're in Illinois. Um, we also market through some other joint ventures with other co-ops too outside of Illinois. So we're very fortunate to I think have, I think, a pretty efficient and effective marketing structure. But uh, the, the chief executive officer uh, and their Main headquarters is housed at Carlinville, Illinois, but uh, Ed Mullins, who's the CEO, and I have a very good rapport and very close working relationship. But in, we've already talked about your role in Country Financial and in Growmark. What's your specific relationship with Prairie Farm? Well, they report to our service company board, so we approve their management budgets, the capital budgets, and, and I uh, work in the... Um, along with the hiring of their CEO and setting his salary with their board of directors. We also have an interlocking board member on that particular board as well. So we have feedback in all these organizations that comes back into our boardroom to know what is going on and keep abreast of what they're doing. Well, as we talk about this, I'm more and more amazed that uh, you're able to keep a farm going at the same time you're wearing all of these other hats now that we've been describing. Well, technology helps you do that, <laughs> whether it's text messaging or being on a cell phone or video conferencing. We, uh, you know, the, the president of Illinois Farm Bureau, whoever it is, uh, it's a full-time job of juggling uh, time and, uh, you know, with the various organizations as well as, you know, being attentive to everything that's going on in Illinois Farm Bureau. Okay. I um, what other organizations do we need to talk about that are under the umbrella? 
Well, Illinois Soybean Association and Illinois Corn operate under an operating agreement with Illinois Farm Bureau, which makes it very good for the employees because they're, um, they operate under our same umbrella, so those employees can move back and forth seamlessly um, within our organization if they want to work for Country Financial or Illinois Farm Bureau and, uh, and then maybe go back to Illinois Soybeans or Illinois Corn. They, those two organizations started in this building and they have now grown of age. Uh, they have about a dozen employees each uh, in their respective organizations, but uh, we have a very you know, good and close working relationship with both of those organizations as well. Is there a credit union or a financial element that's associated with the Illinois Farm Bureau? Yes, we have the IA credit union. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, amongst the family of companies, whether that be Growmark and Country or Illinois Farm Bureau, they're able to uh, utilize the services of the financial aspects through the credit union, whether that's taking out a loan for their house or credit cards. Uh, it's become quite a large organization as well. IAA standing for? Illinois Agriculture Association. Okay. Um, what percentage of your farmers who are members oftentimes get uh, credit through a, uh, one of these credit unions? Then? From the farmer's side, not many. Um, it's more or less for the employees. Okay. Uh, but we do have farmers that utilize the credit card services, and a few of them will from time to time, especially if they're close to the Bloomington uh, location here, but for the most part, no. Okay. We, uh, uh, I would say most of the farmers do not, you know, take loans out uh, from the IA credit union. What's your relationship with IA then? Your particular relationship? With the IA? Yeah. That is us. Illinois Agriculture Association is the umbrella for everybody. That's the umbrella for the family of companies. It also is the Illinois Farm Bureau. Okay. The two are s the same. So I, I'm confusing it when I say the credit union and the IAA are the same thing. It's the IAA credit union? Right, right. Okay. That's, another, that's another distinct division of the organization. Okay. And what's your specific relationship with the IAA credit union then? Okay, well, basically uh, I operate and work with the head of that credit union uh, as kind of a member of the service company that we he reports to the service company board and uh, we monitor that. Uh, it's really more of a function of country financials management right now. That, that changed a little bit uh, here in the last couple of years. Okay. Philip, what else have we missed that you want to talk about in terms of the overall organization? Probably the one aspect we haven't talked about is the IAA Foundation. And um, that really came uh, as a result of a couple things. Number one uh, was telling the story of agriculture to our youth. Uh, the Illinois Ag, Ag in the Classroom program uh, was really started uh, by Secretary John Block, who is a member of our organization when he was Ag Secretary. And that was his idea when he, under the Reagan administration, started that particular project. We started a foundation about the same time and we fund our Ag in the Classroom program uh, through that. We raise funds during the course of the year for uh, various activities that we carry out, but we think it's very important to tell that story and we have a number of agribusinesses and, and commodity groups that help us do that. But that is housed in Illinois Farm Bureau as well. When you say to tell that story, are you talking about the story of the Illinois Farm Bureau or the story of the Illinois farmer? Telling the story of the Illinois farmer and Illinois and American agriculture. And we do that to third and fourth graders. Uh, we think we've got the premier Ag in the Classroom program in the whole country. Um, we've got a very uh, a good outreach with coordinators and I guess under my leadership two years ago we brought the other uh, Ag in the Classroom organization under our umbrella, so now we call it the Illinois Ag in the Classroom organization. And uh, with that, we're able to provide grants um, back to our local communities for our coordinators. We're able to provide materials. Uh, last year, we trained 1,200 teachers uh, through this particular program. 
and we've got uh, uh, really a set of curriculum materials that they can teach a whole unit just on the neat things that are going on in production agriculture. So our third and fourth graders across this state are exposed to that element. Well, this might be one of those times then that we can mention that the 70 some interviews, the video interviews that we've done as part of this project, that yours being one of those 70, uh, could have perfect application to what you're trying to achieve as well then. No doubt about it because I think if we've learned one thing over time is we get so involved on the production side, the marketing side of agriculture, and as we have had generation after generation become further removed from farming, it's even more important to tell that story so that that consumer understands not only where their food came from, how it was produced, uh, the transportation system that, that was involved in getting that particular uh, uh, piece of uh, food to that grocery store that they purchase, but they, they, so that they're aware of all the aspects of food production that takes place uh, right here in, in the state of Illinois. We think we, we are unique in that aspect uh, from the standpoint of trying to hook that consumer right with the producer to understand that whole story. You mentioned this very briefly in our first session today, but tell me why you got into the business with radio broadcasting. RFD, what's the stand for in first, first place? Well, RFD basically is just the, the short acronym of rural farm delivery or, you know, and, but we're not really rural farm delivery anymore. We broadcast in, into some of the major networks uh, mm -hmm. uh, right here in the state. And, and that really came about of trying to help the local farm broadcaster uh, hook into a centralized network that we have right here coming out of this shop. So we, we really provide programming to a number of farm broadcasters across the state. We've got a, a fairly large network of uh, stations uh, scattered around the whole state of Illinois to try to make sure and maintain farm programming into those particular stations. What particularly would be the nature of the farm programming? Well, it would be everything from you talk about food safety, farm bill, farm policy, uh, events that happen on Capitol Hill. The stimulus package is a good example. What does that mean to agriculture? We try to break that down into a, a farm bite size uh, so that people understand the importance and its aspect of agriculture. Are there particular, are you producing a half an hour show or a five minute spot? Exactly how is that happening? A little bit of both. We do targeted spots as well as half hour programming. Um, and that really depends on the local station. Uh, it seems like anymore people are changing instead of the old traditional half hour or hour programs. Now they like the short, concise little sound bites of 30 seconds or a minute, uh, just little updates from time to time. So we do a little bit of all of that. Are there market reports? Yes, they are. That, and really, you go back to when we started this, that was one of the main uh, before all the technology that we have today with computers and, and blackberries and such where farmers can get their Farm Week mobile on their cell phone and that sort of thing, which we provide. Uh, but when we started RFD Radio, that was the means for farmers to find out the latest and greatest of what was going on in the marketplace. We still do that, but it's much more detailed today with issues and, and relevant happenings on a on an hourly or whatever basis. Well, I'm, I know you're aware that we spent quite a few hours interviewing Orion Samuelson, WGN, and he and Max Armstrong have been doing that. Um, Orion's been doing it for close to 50 years. Max's been there for 30. What's different about what RFD is doing versus what you know commercial stations are doing? Well, I'd say we, we do the same thing, but the difference is we probably have more network affiliates than what they have with their super station. Uh, and I think the, diff the, the biggest difference is they're one of the few remaining farm broadcasters in a major metropolitan city. And I think their goal is to try to keep that Chicago area consumer at least engaged in what farming is about or what agriculture is about, whether it's, you know, certain things and events that happen uh, and bring those home to agriculture 
and they're fairly, uh, you know, uh, I think well respected in that uh, area, uh, that they have that large audience in Chicago to try to tell that story. I mean, we've been on their show many times and consider them very good friends, but uh, they, uh, they have a little bit different uh, audience than what we have downstate Illinois. So what you're doing is packaging things for all these local radio stations to, to, to play. Yes. Is it that is strictly for Illinois, or does it go beyond the boundaries of Illinois? For the most part, we're just strictly Illinois. Okay. I mean, we might have some outside fringes because frequency when you get on the, the edges of the state will be in other states, but for the most part, we market it in Illinois only. Mm -hmm. um, I, we've talked about this a little bit, but... Um, can you address just a little bit more about the nature of your lobbying efforts at, at the state level, for example? Do you have a, do you, do you contracted with a, you've got a relationship with a lobbying firm in Springfield? No, we have our own. Uh, we have three registered full-time lobbyists um, that uh, work down there on a daily basis uh, when the General Assembly is in. Uh, myself, as president of this organization, goes down when need be. Uh, we meet with the various leaders, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, uh, the Governor, um, as we go through some of these issues that we've talked about here today. Uh, there's certain times you do have to be there face to face to, you know, present your agenda. But we have three full-time people that uh, uh, that's what they do in Springfield uh, on a daily basis. Can you think of any uh, legislators in either the House or the Senate who uh, you turn to especially to champion some of the issues for agriculture? Well, you know, it, what's, what's interesting about the General Assembly, some of our go-to guys uh, have passed on or retired. Uh, so we, you have to continue to work and network those people that are elected into those positions. But uh, I would suspect Chuck Parkey was one of those when he was in the legislature. Yes, and then became director of ag. I think of Vince DiMuzio, uh, the late Vince DiMuzio was another one that uh, we went to. Uh, Frank Watson, uh, who basically was the Senate minority leader who is just retiring. But there are a lot of good, you know, new people in those positions. Uh, John Sullivan from the western part of the state. He was the Senate ag chair last year. We now have a new Senate Ag Chair and Mike Frerichs from uh, Champaign. So, you know, it, it, you have to change with the times is what I'm trying to say, that uh, we have different players in different positions almost every year. Were there some or are there some legislators that you've had a more prickly relationship with? Well, you know, I can't say that, that we've had a standoff relationship. We've always figured out a way to work with them. Even our previous governor, uh, you know, we, at times we needed to be there and to uh, work with him on various ag issues. So I think, I think that's what makes this organization what it is today. Uh, we figure out a way to work with people on both sides of the aisles and really at any elected position because they're elected there to do their job mm -hmm. and we're elected uh, vice versa from our constituents and our membership to do the same. Most of your tenure as the president has been during Blagojevich's administration, I think. Um, but you've been affiliated with Farm Bureau long before that. Uh, relationship with previous governors, I would think, especially Edgar and Ryan, in your lifetime at least, perhaps Thompson as well. Mm -hmm. uh, any stand out in one way or another? That's a good question. I, uh, I think they're I'm all... i put you on the spot here. I think they're all different. I, you know, I... I probably got my first start with Governor Thompson. Uh, I was uh, involved in the Soybean Association when he was governor. Uh, governor Edgar, uh, we certainly as a county president worked with him quite closely on the chief program, the education funding. You know, we were within a whisker of trying to get a particular piece of legislation through at that time and came up short. Um, I also think of you know, Governor Ryan, uh, his Illinois First program that put a lot of dollars into infrastructure across this state. I think that that was positive. I think we had a good rapport with him. And Governor Blagojevich, uh, you know, we, we had our challenges with him, but, uh, you know, when we were experiencing a drought uh, back a few years ago and some of the, the catastrophes that we had in the state, 
we were able to work with him on that. Well, Governor Blagojevich is out of office now, so can you talk about the nature of the challenges you had with him? Well, I think part of it was that um, some of the things that he threw at the General Assembly. Uh, our organization was opposed to the gross receipts tax. Uh, we felt that that was going to drive business out of our state, uh, as well as harm agriculture. Uh, we also had an issue as it related to the sales tax on inputs. Um, and I think once, you know, he was looking at it or his budget director was looking at it strictly as a way to, to uh, really tap resources and revenue in this state, and we had to bring across the concerns that we had and its impact on agriculture. And at the end of the day, both of those were removed. So we felt good from the standpoint that we were able to communicate and dialogue with one members of the General Assembly and the Governor's Office about how you know, dramatic of an impact it would have on our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have often made the analogy that Illinois is really two states. It's Chicago and it's downstate. And that, uh, that there are distinct agendas in those two states, if you will, and historically, Chicago has controlled the agenda. Um, do you find that an issue you have to uh, grapple with, that that's a struggle to get past Chicago's interest to get yours elevated? Well, I, I don't think it's any more of a struggle than what it's been in the past. Um, and I, l I also view that as opportunity. We have one of the largest food manufacturing corridors in the world in Chicago. And when I came into this position as president, I uh, created a new position called the Director of External Relations. And that person is dedicated strictly to try to interface with these food companies, whether it's Chicago, whether it's the St. Louis area, and trying to bridge that gap. Uh, also, when I came in as president, for the first time we sat down with Mayor Daley face to face and said, you know, we've got a lot to offer as a farm organization in this state and working with you as mayor. Uh, you know, the food manufacturing corridor is a good example. And what struck me out of that first initial conversation with the mayor was he understood the impact of agriculture and that the, the fact that it was the number one industry in this state and that the two of us needed to work together. So consequently, we have been involved with the mayor's office on a number of projects. So I, whether it's been trying to get more ag schools in Chicago, I mean, you got the, the probably the most premier ag high school in the whole country uh, in the Chicago Ag High School. And uh, the mayor would like to have two more of those uh, in Chicago to help teach kids about agriculture. So I think there is a way we can work together and, you know, who knows, if we get the Olympic bid coming up, maybe <laughs> agriculture will be at the table at that. What has been the issue that's most surprised you or maybe the issue that's been most contentious since you've been in Well, I, I'd say a couple, couple, and I don't know if I want to narrow it down. When we found the mad cow uh, and how we handled that as an organization to try to instill consumer confidence back in the food chain, because if you recall, when that happened, we had a dramatic impact on beef prices in this country. They fell out of bed. Yeah, well, I would think most of this is kind of out of your control. It's, the mad cow certainly wasn't discovered here in Illinois, but it... No, but it, it did, I think, ramp up our communication effort to try to get that word out. You know, we have a lot of uh, power in the media right here in this state, uh, with the Chicago media, downstate media, to make sure we get the right facts and story out there, that emotion doesn't run rampant. That probably was one, and... Um, and then I would say probably the other one would be is fending off some of the challenges that we've had in Springfield uh, as it relates to state budget and the impact on our members' bottom lines. And again, your specific concerns about the state budget? Well, it would go back to really a number of the issues, the sales tax on inputs, the GRT um, as examples. Uh, you know, we still have... I think a concern as an organization that we've shrunk the Department of Agriculture, 
that we need to make sure that we keep a main priority on that on that particular mm -hmm. division down there. Uh, so those would be, I guess, a few of the, uh, you know, the the challenges if you're talking challenges. But probably, you know, most recently this last year, watching the roller coaster ride of seven fifty eight dollar corn go down to two fifty. At the same time, we saw our inputs go through the roof, and we saw the grocers manufacturers come after uh, farmers for the first time ever, and saying the reason that we've had to you know raise our price on a box of cereals because of the price of ethanol, which we now know is not true because they haven't lowered their prices and the price of corn is about 60 percent less than it was at the high mm -hmm. of the market. So those are just a few of the examples that we've dealt with, I guess, during my presidency. Been fielding, have you fielded over the years? Um, heated phone calls from local farmers about traceability issues? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, there's not a day that goes by that you don't hear something, whether it's, you know, just as you said, a uh, premise ID or an animal ID issue. Um, I hear from farmers when basis levels, the difference between the futures price and the cash price, get at abnormally wide levels. Uh, you hear, um, case in point, as we're signing up for a new farm bill, problems at the local level. Uh, you'll, you'll get those phone calls to say, do you know that in such and such a county this is going on? So, you know, being the leader of a farm organization in, in a state as large as Illinois can be very unwielding at times with phone calls that come in and they cover the issues cover the whole gamut. Well, let's talk a little bit more about food versus fuel, that whole debate. Because that's certainly, as you mentioned, that's certainly been the forefront of our discussion for the last year and a half or so. Actually, I'd expand it to food versus feed versus fuel. Okay. Great. Because we not only heard it from consumers when we had $4 a gallon gasoline, was this because, you know, this happened. We heard it from livestock producers who, when they started looking at 6 and $7 corn and and $400 a ton bean meal, you know, was this because of ethanol? And then, you know, you, you heard it on the fuel side as we saw $4 gasoline. So it, it really was quite the dilemma that we faced. And what happened really is there was a number of things that, that factored in all at the same time. You had petroleum prices, which commodity prices tend to track petroleum prices. They have historically. And you saw a major impact of index funds, speculators that got into the marketplace that thought this thing was going to the moon. This thing being? Petroleum. And, and, with, and it with it, corn prices were carried with it. At the same time, uh, the Bush administration raised the renewable fuel standard from 7.5 billion gallons to 15 billion gallons for corn-based ethanol. Um, and, and so you had all these factors or all these stars came into a line at the same line at the same time so you had ethanol plants being built they couldn't build them fast enough you saw petroleum or crude oil prices reach almost hundred and fifty dollars a barrel and at the same time the speculative market started pulling their money out of precious metals and investing it uh, in petroleum or corn uh, thinking that we were gonna uh, keep this thing going higher and higher. So that volatility caused some heartburn amongst consumers as they saw grocery prices go up, i.e. Uh, a box of, of cornflakes, but they did not understand that even with that box of cornflakes costing four dollars, there was only about a dime of actual corn involved in that. What really happened when you do a post-mortem of this whole dramatic increase it was the energy that was driving most all of this. When you, when you had $4 a gallon gasoline, $150 uh, a barrel crude, that was probably the major culprit uh, amongst the whole value chain of people focused in and attacked ethanol, of all things, as being the root of the cause of this. And having said that, I think the other thing that was a little undaunting on this is 
and, w and we still stand by it today, is we don't have a comprehensive energy p policy in this country. And you get that volatility that creeps into this. And the farmers not only saw it on what they were paying for gas and diesel fuel, they saw it what happened in their fertilizer. We had fertilizer prices go from $400 a ton anhydrous to $1,200 a ton. And, and in pure um, simplistic terms, that's 40 to $50 an acre more of production costs just in nitrogen that they were having to absorb. So farmers felt it, consumers felt it. And then the, the exodus of the index funds, the collapse of crude oil, and now, you know, today, as we're looking here in February, where we have a glut of crude oil, you know, you're, you're watching all of these things kind of hem-haw around, and you've got the price of corn down to about $3.30 a bushel off of a high of $7.50 a bushel. Was the Farm Bureau in favor of this dramatic expansion of ethanol production? We have said all along that we need a comprehensive energy policy. Of that, we think renewables can play a very important part. And that's not just ethanol, it's biodiesel, it's wind energy, all of the above. And having said that, yes, we think that we can not only produce food in this country given our technology and our production efficiency, we can produce for the livestock producer as well as the, uh, the fuel component of this. We look at our counterparts in South America. I mean, it took them 10 years, but they got to almost self-sufficiency in Brazil as it relates to a comprehensive energy policy that a major component of that is renewable fuels, ethanol. Ethanol um, from sugarcane in this right, case. And not corn-based uh, as we see it in this country. But we think there is a, still a bright future in ethanol. Mm -hmm. We think there's a bright future in renewables. There's been a lot of attention focused on cellulose-based ethanol, but we still believe there's a number of hurdles just like we had with corn-based ethanol to overcome before we get there. There's a lot of different directions we can go when we're into this ethanol discussion. Let me start with this one since you just mentioned South America. What do you say to those who argue that producing ethanol from corn is much less efficient than producing ethanol from sugarcane? And then you get into the discussion about, well, we're subsidizing this because we're placing taxes or tax breaks for our ethanol production here while we're also putting tariffs on foreign ethanol coming in. Well, I think in the very near future, we will see the efficiency of ethanol grow. I, I think corn part of based ethanol? Yes, corn as well as cellulosic. Right now, you can, you can produce it for about a buck and a half a gallon. Uh, Cellulose-based ethanol is about $6 a gallon. And it's not there for a number of reasons. And I think as we've thrown research dollars at ethanol, it will continue to get better. Uh, case in point, the, uh, the water usage of ethanol. Back, uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we used to use seven or eight gallons of water to make one gallon of ethanol. Today, that number is about three. And part of that three now is being recycled and reused many times over to, as you uh, produce ethanol. Same will be, I think, true in the next decade as it relates to cellulose. But we've got to overcome the transportation hurdles with cellulose-based ethanol. You can only move a bulk commodity as bulky as that may be, and that's everything from, you know, stover coming off of corn to trees or whatever. You cannot transport that very far, and you've got to have a storage area to dry that stuff before you can start the process unless we change the process of how we make cellulose-based ethanol. So those are a few hurdles to overcome. As it relates to the subsidy or the tax credits uh, that we have uh, for ethanol, really I think you have to look at this as a, as a growing industry that usually when you start anything, and I think cellulose-based ethanol will be the same, there is going to be some sort of tax credit to get that up and running. And I think at some point in time, uh, as we have seen in the last year, those tax credits will slowly uh, disappear as the industry gets its feet on the ground. Consequently, though, given the price of 
corn that went up to those high levels, we've had a lot of ethanol plants that are now in bankruptcy because they didn't have the corn bought before the escalation in price. And you can't make ethanol when corn is $7 a bushel and make it efficient and profitable at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we've had to address all of those uh, situations as we, you know, had that dramatic ramp up in price. Well, you've mentioned quite a bit, we've talked quite a bit about uh, your involvement, the Farm Bureau's involvement with World Trade Organizations, the level of the playing field, et cetera. But again, the, there's not a level paying playing field when it comes to ethanol coming from Brazil, for example. And we've talked about that uh, as an organization. You know, at what point in time, if we took those import tariffs off today, it ab absolutely is meaningless because through the, um, um, uh, the CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, part of that free trade agreement allows a certain amount of ethanol to come from South America into this country anyway, under a certain level. And uh, I think probably long term, that'll be something that will be on the table to be considered or taken off because right now, they're not producing enough ethanol, ethanol that would have any impact on us. But is that going to be this, the case 10, 15, 20 years from now? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows that at this point in time. So right now it's really a non-player, a non-event. Uh, but I'm sure as we discuss free trade agreements going forward, as it was with CAFTA, uh, I think it'll probably be something that'll be on the table to be discussed. Uh, you mentioned the, the Bush administration's uh, production targets. Are those achievable, you think? I think, you know, they're goals. And, and how I would, would characterize it is if you don't have a goal to shoot at, you don't know where you're going to at least target things. Um, I think it's a little ambitious on the cellulose-based side. Um, there's going to have to be, you know, some government infusion in to make sure that that happens, not only on the, the plant side, but on the research side to make it effective and efficient. Um, on the corn-based side, yes, I think we will hit the 15 billion uh, gallon here in the next three or four years if things can continue to ramp up the way that they have had in the past. And um, we've got to get some infrastructure adjusted uh, to get that 15 billion gallons up and running. By that, I mean I think we need to see more E85 stations than what we have today. We might even look at that blend rate uh, from 10%, which we're about there now, and move that up to maybe 15% ethanol. And we can do that relatively easily uh, if we get the right uh, signals given to the marketplace to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, earlier you were talking about, well, let me frame this question this way. The challenge in American agriculture for the last century, maybe century and a half, is that American farmers are independent operators and they are incredibly efficient, which means that you've got overproduction oftentimes that drives the prices down. And I start with that by saying part of the rationale, as I understood it, for increasing, dramatically increasing ethanol production was to help stabilize corn prices. Or flat out to increase corn prices, and yet you're saying that that's not really what's driving corn prices today. Um, I wonder if you can address that kind of a challenge. Well, it, it, it can be what drives corn prices from the, the sake of demand, uh, but in the case of what we just went through this last year, you had some artificial forces that drove corn prices well beyond where they should have been. Um, I think long term, you know, demand is key, and it, and it doesn't come in the form of just raw number two yellow corn. It comes in the, the form of, you know, distillers grains that are being shipped to China or, you know, other parts of the world. So, you know, as long as you expand that demand pie, you know, you're going to have a market for that. I think the one thing that I think we, we've looked at is the technology that we've had in corn production has been truly amazing. I mean, now we're looking at 160, 170 bushel average corn production uh, yields. Um, some th seem to think in the next decade that number might be 250 bushel corn. So if you're going to 
keep pushing the technology, the research, the genetics, the events that we put into our corn, we also have to increase the demand from a usage standpoint on the other side of the equation. Whether that's growing the livestock industry, whether it's finding new uses for the co-products coming off of ethanol plants, or just trying to fulfill the dietary changes in some of these developing countries. It's all of the above, and that's why trade is important to our organization. It always has been, and it needs to continue to be if we're going to open markets for what we think are going to be future increases in the production side of things. Would it be fair to say then that the Farm Bureau's approach to the kinds of challenges that are out there in agriculture are to grow the market rather than greater government involvement? We've always, always stood by the mantra that we want the marketplace to determine the future viability of the farmer. Uh, there is a role for government, you know, make no mistake about it, to try to put at least a safety net uh, underneath the market so that we don't have a huge exodus of farmers if, the, if for some reason outside of the control of a farmer uh, that a president puts an embargo on or something happens to, to really pull the, the, uh, the, the safety net out of uh, a particular commodity price, there's a role for government to play in that so that we have a stable food supply in this country. So that's really the trick and the role of, of farm organizational leaders is to have that safety net but try to have access to that we can sell our products around the world. Well, we've covered an awful lot of terrain here over about four hours of time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to respo respond to some more general questions to, to kind of finish this thing up. Um, and again, we only have a few minutes of time, I think. What do you think is the biggest change that you've seen in agriculture since you got into it as a young man? I would say probably uh, the, the change in efficiency of what we do. Um, whether it was the technology of taking uh, hybrid seed corn, when I was a youngster growing up on the farm when we thought 100 to 120 bushel corn was a good thing, to now where we raise 200 bushel corn, or on the livestock front of watching hogs go to market uh, in about four and a half months where that used to be about seven. Mm -hmm. uh, that technology has just been amazing. Uh, that's one. And I think the other efficiency is just watching how we've changed uh, just the machinery that we operate in agriculture. I mean, my son is 10 years old, and he doesn't know what a tractor looks like that doesn't have a cab on it. <laughs> and I grew up, and I'm not that old, uh, where it, everything was open air, and we would inhale the dust uh, and, and the wind and the cold. Um, and, you know, the comforts of farming today are far better than they were when I started out. But along with that, I think probably the other change is, is knowing how to manage your risk and uh, your money in your farming operation. This is not uh, a game anymore where you're dealing with a, a few dollars. You're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars in operating notes and, and land has appreciated in value. You're dealing with a much uh, bigger asset value. So we've undergone a lot of change from when I started in the 70s to, to today. And I, I see that change coming even faster as my son hopefully walks into my mm -hmm. uh, shoes, continuing the operation as well as my daughter. Well, that's terrific because that's where I want to end with this. Uh, what is it going to take for your son if he decides to go into agriculture to be successful? Well, I think... What does he need? What skills does he need? I think you need a strong education uh, and get as many life experiences as possible. Does he need a college education? I think it's almost essential. Uh, and I say that because the things that are being taught today are going to change so quickly by the time he gets to come back to the farm. What would you tell him to study in college? I think if I were going to, you know, tell them one thing, uh, and I, this is kind of the where with all that I had when I went to college is I had a strong desire uh, to have an accounting background. I think marketing, financial expertise, I don't care what kind, 
is going to be imperative because of the dollars that you're going to be working with. I think the other thing that I would study is trade because we have to understand what our overseas customers want and try to provide that in a form that they'll, they'll buy it from us. We're on a global stage and to get to know other parts of the world I think is going to be essential as you try to determine what type of products that you want to grow and market those. Excellent. Um, what do you see, that? this is the last question here, what do you see as the future for farming in Illinois? Bright? I think uh, extremely bright. Uh, we've got some challenges right now that we're facing. But I think for the first time in my life that you've got more marketing opportunities out there to grow corn and soybeans, cattle and hogs than we've ever had. We've got unit trains that service uh, the cattle feed yards in Texas to where we grow distiller's grain for people in China. And uh, for, for the renewable fuel side, whether it's the windmills that are going up in this state, the ethanol plants that have been built, the unit trains that are up and running, I think we've got some tremendous opportunities for commodity production agriculture right here in Illinois. Okay. How about the future of the family farm? Well, I think it, it, it too has a great future in front of it. It's not going to look like it did when my dad and mom raised six kids or my grandparents before them. Um, but I think it's going to be how you're going to network with other farmers, uh, maybe joining operations uh, to try to share overhead uh, uh, costs. I think that, uh, you know, that family farm is just going to change and continue to change as we get probably larger operations and more specialized operations. Okay. Well, again, I think we've had something like four hours of conversation here. We've covered a huge range of subjects, but it's very obvious to me that everything we end up talking about are things you've spent a lifetime thinking about and articulating with all kinds of views across the entire state, if not the entire world, I guess, since you've traveled throughout the entire world. So it's been a thrill for me to, to interview you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Any final comments? I have too. I, I think... I, I hope that through this interview you've understood the importance of agriculture and you know our organization, Illinois Farm Bureau, has kind of been at the forefront on a number of these issues. Well, thanks very much, Bill. Thank you.